What is going on guys, Vert Devoten here, and today I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, so first and foremost, uh, this is probably the best alternative to Baldur's Gate 3 if you're looking for a tabletop RPG video game. I think it is the most faithful to the D&D 5th uh, edition rules, even more so than Baldur's Gate. Uh, Solasta which is the name of this game, Crown of the Magister, is actually the game that really retaught me the rules of fifth edition and really helped me understand how to play Baldur's Gate 3. And since Baldur's Gate 3 patch seven has had and continues to have a lot of crazy issues depending on which mod manager you're using, um, I decided to make this video for a buddy of mine, HVAC Gamer, who uh, has had this game for a while, who is really into the turn-based um, tabletop sort of uh, idea, and I'm really trying to push him over the edge to give this game a shot, and so I'm going to do the same to you. Now, I am going to play a podcast that is focused on Yuval Noah Harari. If you don't know who that is, he is arguably in my point of view, in the top 10, if not top five thinkers alive today. Uh, his book, uh, Sapiens, is... Uh, I don't know if I want to say revolutionary. It's just very... Uh, I guess it's revolutionary in that it looks at humans the way we are, not the way we want to see ourselves. And he expands on this in his second book, um, Homo Deus and he's got a third book I haven't read yet uh, called Nexus which is kind of the highlight of this but the reason that I'm kind of highlighting this is that the podcast that he's on is with Sam Harris and Sam Harris like a lot of podcasters in the golden age of podcasting um, probably going on five years ago I really you know found him with some other podcasters and you know, started from episode one and just even though they had like two or three years in of uh, episodes and I was really grooving on it. Um, I think his podcast uh, in the early days exposed me to some ideas, especially within um, Buddhism and mindful meditation, which I am forever grateful for. But it has become clear to me over time listening to it and I had to kind of stop, I think around like, I don't know, like episode 150 or maybe even closer to 200. But uh, while Sam Harris presents himself as a uh, scientific atheist, which I think he is, how he came about doing this stuff had a very large impact um, by 9-11. And I think, ironically, uh, he is clinging to that and the threat of not just Muslim jihadists, but m Muslims overall. I, I, I do think he is an actual bigot. Like, I, he, I think he has lost the plot and cannot see, even though he has specifically stated it, that he feels like it is his mission, it is his job to expose Islam as a radical religion. And I... Keep in mind, I don't disagree with that. I think all religions are radical. Um, but I think where he loses the plot is that he is constantly, I think more now in the last few years, or maybe he's always done this and I just haven't seen it. He's grouping all Muslims together, basically. And he'll say that he's not, but then... <laughs> He'll say shit like he did on Bill Maher when um, Ben Affleck flipped out on him. And uh, it's just, it's to the point where I'm, I can't really listen to him. But at the same time, I can't find a podcast that goes as in depth as Yuval, with Yuval Noah Harari as this one and it may be out there if anyone knows of it please let me know i would uh i would love to get into that and not have to come back to this podcast again but i'm gonna go ahead and play it so that's my disclaimer and uh hopefully you enjoy the conversation uh, I've, I've listened to about 
uh, maybe a quarter of it. And then I was like, ah, oh, I really want to get this one gaming. And I hope you enjoy the game. So Lasso right now, I believe is on sale for Steam for like $8.99 or something. Now, I don't know if that includes all the DLC, but oh my God, it's so fucking worth it. Yuval Noah Harari, thanks for joining me again. It's good to be here again in, in you know, in a real space together. Yeah, this is, you are my first interview in this <laughs> studio, which uh, is auspicious because we share so many interests. We have struggled for years to talk about meditation, and mm. uh, you think we might get there this time. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm determined at least to say yeah. at least something about meditation this time. <laughs> yeah, well, it's there, there's so much going on in the world that it's... Uh, it's always a challenge to get to that. We can topic always connect it. I mean, we can talk about Nasrallah and meditation. I think there are many links there. Right. It would yeah, be yeah. Worth exploring. <laughs> as counterintuitive as that sounds. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if meditation is not related to the world and to the ar to reality, it's it's worthless. That, that's true. Yeah. I guess I well, I feel like I'm I'm perhaps selling our audience short in thinking that they don't have the bandwidth to think about it, given all the chaos. Mm. And given given your expertise that is so relevant to so much of the chaos, um, you just mentioned Nasrallah. So the the time we're recording this, it was just announced that mm -hmm. that uh, Israel killed uh, Hassan Nasrallah, who's the who was the head of Hezbollah, uh, which we'll talk about uh, perhaps in the. So I, I want to focus what you've done in your recent book mm -hmm. Nexus, which is wonderful, and here, um, and uh, perhaps you can say. How, how this relates to your two other big books, Sapiens mm. and Homo Deus. So what, what is, how do you view the, the, the project that you've... So it, it starts basically where Sapiens and Homo Deus ended. Uh, in Sapiens, I, I covered how this insignificant ape from a corner of Africa took over the world. And in Homo Deus, I explored what could be the potential future of, of us and of our products and creations here on earth and uh, nexus starts with a key question about both the past and the future which is if humans are so wise why are we so stupid mm -hmm. like you know we've reached the moon and we split the atom and we can decipher dna but um we are on the verge of destroying ourselves in so many different ways it could be ecological catastrophe. It could be a world war, a nuclear war. Uh, we are producing uh, the most powerful technology in history, AI, which might quite easily get out of our control and enslave or, or destroy us. And we know all that, and yet we keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So w w what's happening? And so many mythologies and theologies throughout history said that the blame is that something is wrong in human nature, that we are flawed, deeply flawed. Mm. And I don't think that this is the right answer. I think that the problem is not in our nature. The problem is in our information. If you give good people bad information, they make bad decisions. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. And uh, so th then the question becomes, why are we flooded? with bad information. Why is it that after thousands of years of, of history, of developing, you know, sophisticated networks of information and, 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 uh, and communication, our information is not getting any better? I mean, at the present moment, you can say that humans have the best, the most sophisticated information technology in history, and we are losing the ability to even talk with each other. And, and to listen and to hold a reasonable conversation. So, so what, what's happening? That, that's the key question of Nexus. And it explores um, the history of information and, and of information networks. It takes another look at history, f but from the viewpoint not of, of humanity, but of information. And for instance, I look at, uh, or Nexus looks at the history of democracies and dictatorships, not as we usually think about them, as different ethical systems that believe in different ideals, but as different information networks, that how information flows differently in a democracy, in a, in a dictatorship. In a dictatorship, you know, there is one hub where, where all the decisions are being made, 
So all the information flows to and from that single center. And a democracy is a distributed information system in which decisions are being made in many different places and much of the information never passes through the center. Like if you think about the United States, so you have the center at Washing- in Washington, but so many decisions are made elsewhere, like here in, in, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles. And um, m- most information never passes through the center. And you can think about the historical struggle between democracy and dictatorship in terms of uh, different models of information flows. Yeah, I want to pass over that ground again, because what you're saying is pretty counterintuitive and it's very interesting. So it could, because people think about democracy and dictatorship as this kind of binary that are just categorically distinct, and you're placing them on a continuum of information flow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, there, I mean, so, so let's, let's add here this, what, what you call the naive view of, mm-hmm. of information, because it's, there's, there's a sense that more information is an intrinsic good, right? Mm-hmm. And then we're getting this now with, yeah. with the, <laughs> the people who are running our, our social media regimes. It's just yes. the idea that if you could just let all ideas collide, and r- remove every point of friction from the flow of information and amplify anything however a market or the dynamics of any internet business chooses to amplify it. Uh, there's, it's just the principle, you know, so people have these phrases in their minds, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, mm. right? So let's just expose everything <laughs> and we're gonna be fine, right? And any effort to steer this information flow is by its very nature sinister. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. You know, it is edging us toward the totalitarian side of this information continuum. Uh, so, how do we react to that? I mean, this is this is so intuition? naive. This is so disconnected from reality, from history. Uh, you think that you flood the world with information, and the truth will just rise to the surface? It won't. It will sink to the bottom. Information isn't truth. Most information is junk. Um, it's like thinking that more food is always good for you. The more you eat, the more healthy you, you will be. That's the same thing. No. I mean, yes, you need some food to survive, but if you just keep eating, it will not be good for you, especially if you keep eating junk food. And uh, the, the world basically needs an information diet. And, you know, the truth is a subset of information and a very small subset because the truth, first of all, it's, it's very costly. If you want to write or to produce a truthful account of something, of the Roman Empire, of the economic crisis, whatever, you need to invest a lot of time and effort and money in looking for evidence and fact-checking and analyzing. Like, I don't know, if you want to know something that happened in the Roman Empire, so, you know, historians, they, they go to university to study for at least 10 years before they become professional historians. You learn Latin and Greek and how to read ancient handwriting and how to do these archeological excavations. And even if you found a document from the Roman Empire and you know Latin and you can read it, maybe it's just propaganda. Just because Caesar says that the enemy had 100,000 soldiers, it doesn't mean they actually had 100,000 soldiers. So how do you evaluate information? So the truth is very costly. Fiction, on the other hand, is very cheap. You just write the first things that comes to your mind. The truth is also uh, very complicated, or often it's complicated because reality is complicated. Whereas fiction, can, can, you can make it as simple as you would like it to be. And people tend to prefer, in most cases, uh, simplicity over complexity. So okay, this is so another disadvantage. So you're, you're pointing out there an, asymm- an asymmetrical relationship between truth and fiction. Absolutely. Which redounds to the advantage of fiction in this friction-free environment. And, and, and there is the third advantage of fiction, that the truth is sometimes, not always, but the truth is sometimes painful. You know, from the personal relationships that we often don't know, want to know the truth about how we treat 
uh, uh, the other people in our lives. This is why we need to go to therapy for many years to, to, to acknowledge the reality. You know, all the way to entire nations or entire cultures, if you run for elections in the, in the US or in Israel or anywhere else, and you just tell people the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I mean, an Israeli politician who would just tell the truth about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not likely to gain many votes that way. You need at least some dose of fiction, of mythology to make it more attractive, more pleasant for the voters. Well, it's already so unpleasant. I, I shudder to think what the truth is, but we'll get there. <laughs> so, so, I, so the truth is, is it's costly, it's complicated, it's sometimes painful. Fiction is cheap, it's simple, it, you can make it as attractive as you'd like it to be. So in a completely free market of information, truth will lose. You have to tilt the balance in favor of truth by building institutions like courts, like newspapers, like universities, like research centers that uh, uh, make the effort to produce and to protect the truth. Mm. And when people attack these institutions, they often, they often claim that they are liberating people from the yoke of these elite institutions and conspiracy and so forth. But, but no, when you destroy all trust. So I'm going to stop there just for a quick second. Um, hopefully those in America and Canada should recognize this sort of attack on higher education because it's a, at least in America, since Reagan, it has been a, like a, just a blitzkrieg against any sort of higher education um, and any sort of institutional fact checking as we've seen today. I think it was uh, uh, Douglas Murray actually the other day had this ridiculous article where he kind of uh, exposes himself as the fraud he is. He says that he claims that fact checking is censorship. And I said, if you think fact-checking is censorship, your problem isn't with censorship, it's with facts. And people like this attack higher institutions while they have gone to them. You look at like J.D. Vance, I think he went to Harvard or Yale, one of those two. Every, almost, I can't say every, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Boberts, like I'm talking like the backwoods cousin fuckers of Congress, um, did not go to an Ivy League school, but these people like Ted Cruz went to Harvard. Tom Cotton, I believe, went to Harvard. I think he went to Harvard, it might've been Yale. But anyway, like uh, all these people who sit there and fawn that there is some sort of like liberal bias in these institutions attended these institutions. They they plan on having their children attend institutions. They attack these institutions because these are the institutions as uh, Mr. Harari is saying here is the counterbalance to the fiction that we, the same Republicans like tell in stories in order to get elected and stay in office. Um, and I think this is not lost on most people, but I think there's a huge subset of the American public that do not understand that in our society, the only way that you are truly going to quote unquote, get ahead, stay ahead of inflation is to either get a union job or to get a college degree. And even now that college degree is kind of like a high school degree at this point, like what a high school degree was in the seventies. Um, you almost have to have a master's to get to kind of break through that 150 to 200K threshold, right? So just know that this, this attack isn't something that is new. It's not something that is um, deeply thought out. This is basically them trying to produce, you know, the dumb cattle of society. So you will sit there and rage against wokeness and go to your $7 and 50 cent an hour job, live off of benefits and own nothing and keep voting in the people who are propagating, right? Your terrible life. 
in these institutions, you're paving the way for dictatorship. If uh, society needs institutions, and uh, democracy works on trust. But if you destroy all trust, the only alternative left to hold society together is with terror, which is what dictatorships do. So this is the game of many would-be dictators. They systematically destroy all trust in the institutions. And again, I feel like I need to lay this out. This is exactly what Trump has done. And this is not Trump specific. Trump is just the unhinged pinnacle of this idea. Again, this, I mean, you can sit there and say like oh, all of human history or, or all of American history. Well, uh, either or human, American, we'll stick with American. Let's try to keep it somewhat micro. Um, all of American history is based on that sort of idea of terror and subjugation. But since um, Reconstruction, it has, and especially since the Civil Rights era, it has been the Nazi party that has continued to try to use fear, terror, terror of the other, terror of people who are black, terror of women, terror of immigrants, of anyone that doesn't look like you, anyone who doesn't politically align with you. And that is how you get people to do atrocities. That's how we got Nazi Germany. So. That our, uh, our, our main access to, to truth on, and knowledge, and then when all these institutions are, are, are gone, um, then the only alternative left is a dictatorship. So, so what would you say to someone who says that the institutions have proven themselves to be untrustworthy, right? So we have the capture of the most elite in, uh, academic institutions, certainly to, in, in the United States, by a kind of woke moral panic, mm -hmm. right? You have yeah. Hamas supporters, n not only I, among I, the students, I'll, I'll but among the I'll be happy to talk about that, and I have a lot of criticism of my own kind of disciplines and institutions that I'm, I'm sometimes, you know, I'm... You hear things from people who went to study history for 10 years, and then they come up with the most simplistic views <laughs> of reality right. that, okay, so, uh, so what so but so let's take let's stay at the so, thirty thousand foot level. The experts in many institutions have heaped shame upon their own heads in recent years. But the reaction is not to destroy the institutions. I mean, this is why we need two things. First of all, we need several institutions, not just one, so they keep each other in check. I mean, the, the basic assumption is humans are fallible. Institutions are composed of humans, so all institutions are fallible. They can make mistakes, they can be captured, they can be corrupted, and therefore you need several institutions to keep each other in check. So if one institution is really corrupted, you can go to the courts or you can expose it in newspapers or, or in other media or whatever. And secondly, every institution needs a self-correcting mechanism. This is the sign of a good institution, that it has mechanisms inside the institution to identify and correct its own mistakes. This is, again, a key difference between democracy and dictatorship. Dictatorship has no self-correcting institution. There is no mechanism in Russia that can expose and correct Putin's mistakes. But democracy is all about self-correction. That, you know, the, the basic mechanism of elections is that every four years or so, you can say, oh, we made a mistake. Let's try something else. But of course, uh, uh, every this every mechanism like this is itself fallible. Elections can be rigged, like we just had elections in Venezuela, and the Venezuelan people said, "Okay, we made a mistake with Chavez and Maduro. Let's try something else." But because Maduro is in power, uh, he rigged the election. He said, "No, no, no, I won." And this is also, of course, very very relevant to what's happening in in the ele upcoming election in the United States, because the greatest danger for a, a democracy in a democracy you give power to someone to for for four years on condition that they give it back, and there is always the danger: what if they don't give it back? So giving power to somebody that you have good reasons to suspect that he will not give it back, very dangerous. So again, elections are not enough. You also need the free media. You also need free courts. Now people ask, okay, so what if all these institutions are corrupted? Then bad luck. I mean, nothing is perfect. If all the institutions of your society has been corrupted and taken over and all the self-correcting mechanisms 
are, are, are uh, 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 disrupted, dysfunctional, very bad news. Yeah. Society yeah. collapses. Uh, hopefully, we don't reach that point. And it's very important to uh, uh, try. And the, the, the solution is not to lose trust. One of the key problems I see today in the world is that you have an extremely cynical view of humans and of human societies spreading, mm -hmm. both on the right, but also on the left. This is something that the, the, the extreme left and the extreme right agree about. They have an extremely cynical view of humans and of reality. They say that the only reality is power, that all social interactions, all human interactions are actually power struggles, that all human institutions are just conspiracies to gain power, that journalists, scientists, historians, judges, politicians, these are just conspiracies to gain power. Whenever somebody tells you something, you shouldn't ask, is it true? Because nobody cares about the truth. This is naive. They would tell you, no, this is a power play. Who benefits? Who benefits? Yeah. Yeah. Whose privileges are being served? Whose interests are being served? This is something you hear from Marxists and from Trumpists. This is something that Donald Trump agree with Karl Marx, at least on that, that everything is just a power struggle. And if you think like that, all trust collapses, and the only thing that is left standing, that can remain standing, is a dictatorship, which indeed assumes that everything is just power. Now, the, the important thing to realize is that this is not just extremely cynical, this is just wrong. People are not these power-crazy demons that care only about power. Even powerful people really care about the truth, at least some of them. Well, you, even I would just add, I, I totally agree with you, but I would add as a footnote to that cynicism, even if the, if the, if the cynical take were true, people's incentives are not perfectly aligned. So even mm -hmm. in a rivalry of people seeking power, the, the kinds of conspiracies and collaborations and, and Orwellian uh, you know, star chambers uh, rarely exist the way populists mm. imagine, right? I mean, it's just you can't get, you, you take, you take, uh, you know, the, 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 you take the Elon Musk and Donald conspiracy. Trump. What was that? You take Elon Musk and Donald Trump, mm. you know, um, two people with a very high opinion of themselves yeah. and with not necessarily the same goals in, right. in, in life yeah. and in the world, even if they can ally themselves for some time around a certain common interest, in the long last, run, yeah. it will be very, very difficult to keep this alliance. Yeah, yeah. to say nothing of the people who, would, who are not aligned with them. So, so I, I, there, there's a fascinating tension between the the self-correcting mechanism that would deliver truth mm -hmm. and the self-correcting mechanisms that would deliver order. There's mm. this trade-off between truth and order that you describe in the book. Yeah, let's let's cycle on that for a minute. Okay, that's that's very important because, and if we think about human societies really as information networks, so the question is, what do these networks produce? And to function, they need to produce two different things, not just one. They need to produce both truth and order. A system that just ignores the truth completely will collapse. It will sooner or later encounter reality and will collapse. But also a system which is only interested in the truth will not be able to maintain order because it's easier to maintain order with fiction and with fantasy and with mass delusions. So, so, and, so, so to, we, let's uh, take a concrete example. Yeah, but I just I want to mm. just uh, capture people's uh, confusion here. So, we just spoke about that the the tension between truth and fiction, mm -hmm. as though fiction were by definition invidious and 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 something to be canceled. What you're saying now is that we need certain fiction. It's, it, it can't be purely truth-seeking. Mm -hmm. Fiction is very efficient in creating order. And the, the, the main thing is that it's complicated to maintain a human society. 
It's complicated because you need to balance two things that are pulling in different directions. You need to balance truth with order. There's lots of and trade-offs. Yes, yeah. and and I'll, I'll, I'll give I'll, I'll give one example of, of of how it works. Think, for instance, that you want to produce an atom bomb. So let's say that you are Iran and you want to produce an atom bomb. You need to know some facts about the world. It's essential. If you just ignore the facts of nuclear physics, you will not be able to produce an atom bomb. It's as simple as that. On the other hand, to produce an atom bomb, just knowing the facts of physics is not enough. You need millions of people to cooperate on the project. If you have a single physicist, she is the most brilliant physicist in history, and she knows that E equals MC square and all the secrets of quantum mechanics and whatever, she cannot produce an atom bomb by herself, working in her garage or something. You need people to mine uranium, you know, thousands of kilometers away. You need engineers and workers to build the nuclear reactor. You need people to produce food so that all these workers and physicists have something to eat. How do you get millions of people to cooperate on the project? If you just tell them the facts of physics, E equals MC square. Now, now get on with it. It doesn't work. So what? So just because E equals MC square, we should now work on building this atom bomb? No. This is where ideology and mythology and fictions come into the picture. Um, you usually convince millions of people to work on a project together by telling them some ideology or some mythology. And here, the facts don't matter so much. If you try to build a very powerful ideology and you ignore the facts, your ideology is still likely to explode with a very, very big bang. Uh, and in most cases in history, the people who are experts in, uh, in nuclear physics, for instance, get their orders from the people who are experts in Shiite theology or in Jewish theology or in communist ideology or in Nazi ideology. Um, it's uh, the people who are experts in the truth usually get orders from the people who are experts in order. And this is something that, that very often scientists and, and, and you know, uh, engineers don't understand. That they work, I don't know, on AI, and they think that the scientists and the engineers will decide what to do with it. But no, once you produce this very powerful technology, because you know the facts about the world, then you will get the uh, uh, people who are expert in mythology and theology coming in and telling you, thank you very much for producing this very powerful technology. Now we will decide but, but what is, to do is, with it. Is there a truly benign and wise version of this? Because what you seem yes. to be describing is, is a uh, yet another reason for cynicism and distrust. Yes, so, so th th this, is, this is important. Now, it's very hard to create large-scale societies without any fictions. Even money is a fiction. Even, you know, think about what is the last thing that still holds American society together? What is the last thing that Republicans and Democrats still agree on? It's the dollar. And even this is under attack, you know, from cryptocurrencies and so forth. But almost the last story that still holds the place together is that everybody agrees on the value of a dollar, which is just a fiction. So but I, I just, but I, fictions I, are... I, I just, sorry, I just I want to drill down on this a little bit because I think, I think we hit this in a previous conversation. There's something a little confusing about your use of the word fiction here because fiction in, in any kind of context where we're talking about the truth sounds intrinsically pejorative, right? So like this is, fic there's truth and then there's fiction. Uh, it's not so pejorative. You're, you're talking about conventions. So something that's conventionally something constructed. Something that comes or, out of the human imagination yeah. and not from reality. Yeah. I mean, the value of the dollar is purely an imaginary reality. Exactly, yeah. The paper, paper the dirty paper, paper in notes, your pocket, and most dollars yeah. are not even yeah. paper. They're just digital tokens in computers. Right. They have no objective value. Yeah. Uh, they have value only in our imagination. In so, this sense, the so dollar is a fiction. constructed reality. Yes. Yeah. And another big question comes, so um, so, uh, so is, is everything just a conspiracy? Is everything just a fiction? And the key thing is that. I'm just going to pause and say that uh, the key thing in fiction is very poignant right now in Solasta. So we are dealing with shape-shifting lizards from another dimension 
that we are going to see here very soon. It's called Connecting the Dots. Fictions can be extremely valuable and positive provided you acknowledge they are fictions. Uh, I'm, I don't think that the dollar is a bad thing. I don't think that uh, the fictions holding society together are a bad thing as long as you acknowledge the reality that this is a man-made imaginary thing. And this is important because then you can correct it. Then you can make amendments in it. Let's compare two texts that are foundation texts for holding human society together. The Ten Commandments and the U.S. Constitution. I have both, a preference. Both are fictional in the sense that they came out of the human imagination. But one text refuses to acknowledge this reality, and the other text is fully honest about it. So the Ten Commandments, they start with, I am your Lord God. This text, it claims to be written by God, not by any human, which is why it contains no mechanism for correcting its errors. And if some of our listeners are outraged, errors in the Ten Commandments, what could possibly be, 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 be wrong with don't kill and don't steal? I don't think well, I have those listeners. You, uh, you give me too much credit. <laughs> Yes, but maybe for the one or two are still left out there. Notice if you read, for instance, the 10th commandment, that it endorses slavery. Right. Uh, the 10th commandment says that you should not covet your neighbor's house or field or slaves, which uh, implies that God is perfectly okay with people holding slaves. It's just God doesn't like you like it when you covet the slaves of your neighbors. No, these are his slaves. Don't covet them. Now, because the text doesn't recognize that this is the creation of the human imagination, there is no 11th commandment which says, well, if you discover something wrong in the previous 10 commandments, by a two-third majority, you can vote on changing commandment num number 10. No mechanism. So we still have the same text from the Iron Age until today. Now, the U.S. Constitution, it's also a foundational text which gives instructions for people to how to manage their society. It also came out of the human imagination. It's not, the, it, it's not a, a, an objective reality. It's also, in this sense, a fiction. Uh, but it is honest. It starts with we the people. We the people wrote this text. And because we are fallible human beings, maybe we made some mistakes, like endorsing slavery. So we also include in this text a mechanism to amend it, to identify and correct its own mistakes. It's not easy, but it can be done, and it has been done. Um, so fictions can be extremely valid. We need them. We cannot have a large-scale society without them, but they should be honest about their own fictional nature, which gives us the ability to identify and correct our mistakes or the mistakes of our ancestors. But, but there's something intrinsically conservative about this picture because it's, it, it, admitting that something is a fiction or, or a convention is not to say that you should um, want to revise it uh, impetuously, right? Absolutely it, it's, not. It's very good that, that very few people try to rethink the convention about whether to drive on the left side or the right side of the road on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just you, we, you, it's an arbitrary de decision. It's clearly arbitrary, but it's it's crucially important that we all, once we've decided, that we, we not keep rethinking it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and there are many things like that. And so this this distrust in institutions, that what has grown so corrosive, is the sense that the appropriate response to each of the errors, however embarrassing they have been of late, is to break fully with the institutions and, in some sense, reinvent civilization on your scratch. own. From, you, yeah. find, you find some place to stand where you can reboot from. Mm -hmm. And that actually seems to be, I mean, it, you know, obviously there's there's a populist uh, version of this, which we can talk about. I, I think we should talk about populism. But it, it, this this message seems to be coming from on high. I mean, you, you mentioned Donald Trump and Elon Musk as, as mm -hmm. prime offenders. They're, they're prime offenders on this very point. They, they, they so distrust in our institutions on, yeah. on such a fundamental level and at such scale 
that it's I, coming it, from the right and from the left. It's it's the populist position. It's the Marxist position. Yeah. Let's destroy the old world and create a new world in its place. This is in the international, in the in the in the in the, in the uh, Heim. How do you call it? Of of, of communism. Uh, and it's also on on the populist right. And you know, as a historian, I tend to be conservative. In, in the deep sense of the word, in the Burkean sense of the word. I mean, what you saw recently all over the world is the suicide of conservative parties, that they abandoned the conservative values and became revolutionary parties. Like the Republican Party today in the United States is a, rev is a revolutionary party. It's revolutionary a, it's a in the sense- personality cult, yeah. It's, it's, not, not just that, it says that, you know, all the institutions are rotten, they cannot be reformed, we just need to destroy all of it and start again. Which, I mean, people can say, this is true, this is false, let's leave that aside, but just look at the structure of, of it. It's, it. This is what revolutionary parties look like. They say things are so corrupted, things are so out of order, that the only thing left to do is to destroy all the existing institutions and start from scratch, which it was the Leninist position, the Bolshevik position, a hundred years ago, and now it's the position of many so-called conservative parties. The, 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 the traditional insight of conservatism is that, yes, institutions are flawed, institutions can, can be corrupted, but it takes generations to build a functioning society, a functioning institution. Humans don't really have the capacity to understand the full complexity of reality and to invent a perfect society from scratch. It just can't be done. Every time we try to do it, it leads to disaster. Even worse than the things that we try to, co to, 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 to correct. You cannot create a perfect society. So move more slowly, be more respectful of the existing institutions and traditions. They need correction, they need amendment, they need improvement, but just destroying them completely and starting from scratch. I mean, you have hundreds of years of kind of previous corrections from real things that happened in history that are baked into the system, be very careful before you throw all of it out and try to start from scratch. Okay, so what do we do about social media given that picture? What, what advice do you have for um, the, correcting the obvious pathology we see here? Maybe if you could give advice to Elon Musk or, or Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, what would you have one do? thing, uh, two things. Corporations should be liable for the actions of their algorithms, and uh, only humans have freedom of speech. Bots and algorithms do not have freedom of speech, and they should never masquerade as humans. Mm -hmm. So these are the two main things that, that are needed that are, that, to, to correct social media. So they're publishers. But, the, these platforms should be viewed as publishers. Absolutely. And, and their algorithm, the tuning of the algorithm, is an editorial choice. Absolutely. But this is it, it, strange to think about it, but, but one of the first jobs that was fully automated was not taxi drivers, it was not textile workers, it was editors, news editors. It's amazing to think about it, it, it was automated. The job that once belonged to Lenin and Mussolini is now being done by algorithms. I mean, Lenin, before he was Soviet dictator, he was editor of a newspaper, uh, Iskra, and Mussolini also, he rose to power from being editor of the newspaper Avanti. So this was like the promotion scale, the promotion ladder. Editor of a newspaper, dictator, dictator of the country. Yeah, yeah. And this is for a good reason. I mean, the editors of, of news, they sit at one of the most important junctions in society. They shape the conversation. They decide what people would be aware of, what people would be discussing. And uh, this is what some, one of the most important positions in society. And now it's been taken over by algorithms. Because, again, in, in Iskra, it was Lenin who decided what would be the top story of the day, what would be the main headline. And on Facebook, it's an algorithm deciding what is at the top of your feedback, of your, of your news mm. uh, but, feed. But both of those and sound bad. So you, you, if you're gonna give people a choice between Lenin and an algorithm, <laughs> they're gonna take the algorithm. So no, the, the thing is that in, in, not in a dictatorship, in a democracy, newspapers and other news outlets are liable for their decisions. Like if the editor of the New York Times decides to publish some conspiracy theory or fake news at the 
front page of the New York Times, he cannot hide or she cannot hide be, uh, behind the argument, but free speech, there are some people who believe it's true, so I put it on the front page of the New York Times. No, your job as editor is not just to put something random there or something that would please people. Your job is to fact check and to take responsibility for these decisions and to make sure that if you publish something on the front page of the New York Times, you better be sure that uh, uh, this is accurate and this is responsible. And if you don't know how to do it, then you're in the wrong job. And what, uh, again, I, I will tell to, you know, to Facebook, to, to Twitter, to TikTok, I, be very, very careful before you censor human users. I mean, if, if a human user decided to publish even a lie, even a fake news, even a conspiracy theory, I would be extremely careful before I shut down their account or, or send those in. But if, the, if my algorithm as the corporation then decides to promote this particular piece of fake news or this particular conspiracy theory, this is on me. So that's, this that's is on the company, variable, not on the user. The promotion is, is, is the yes. amplification, not the fact that it exists on the network in the first place. Because Ab you, absolutely. They, they, they can't possibly prevent, and they have billions of pieces of content arriving mm -hmm. every day, right? So they can't they can't guarantee that there'll be no malicious lies or no, even and, and they need child not. pornography on their on their network. And they need, it's the same yeah. way that, you know, we, people send letters to the New York Times every day. So it's not the, the position of the, the job of the New York Times to send them with them. But don't publish them on your front page unless you're sure that you did, you know, and sometimes, okay, you sometimes even make mistakes. But still, your job is to fact check and to, to think about the, 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 the implications of this story and then take a very responsible decision about what you choose to promote. The other thing is that social media should reserve freedom of speech to human beings not to bots and to algorithms. And in particular, uh, uh, we should ban fake humans, counterfeit humans. If a bot pretends to be a human, we should know about it. Like if you see that some story on Twitter gains a lot of traction, a lot of traffic, and you, you think to yourself, oh, lots of humans are interested in this story. This must be important. I also want to know what everybody's talking about. And you also start, you, you click on it, you also start commenting on it. But actually, the entities that at least originally pushed this story to the top of the conversation, they were not humans. They were bots yeah. working in the service of, of Putin or whoever. This is wrong. We should not have fake humans shaping the human conversation. You know, again, democracy is a conversation. Imagine it as a group of people standing in a circle talking with each other. Suddenly, a group of robots join the circle and talk very loudly, Pretending very to be persuasively. Humans. They pretend to be humans and you don't know. You can't tell. Who are the humans and who are the robots? So you're, but so the you're conversation not, to, breaks down. To be clear, you're not against bots of various kinds. You you just think they should be declared as bots. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, if, if if you have a medical bot and you want to consult right. with that bot about some medical condition, I mean, soon we'll have AI doctors with capabilities far beyond human doctors. I'm not against that. They can improve healthcare dramatically. They can help provide better healthcare for billions of people. Uh, but when I talk with a non-human entity, I want to know that this is a non-human entity, that I'm not talking with a human being. They are welcome to join the conversation on condition that they don't masquerade as humans. Hmm. So, so what you're arguing for essentially, and I think this is a phrase you use in the book, that what, what we need are benevolent networks that have a fiduciary responsibility to their hmm. users. Yeah, it's a very old principle. I mean, we don't need to invent anything yeah. new in this respect. Like if you think about your doctor or your therapist or your accountant or your lawyer, uh, for centuries, we already had these regulations and understanding that they have access to extremely private information, to potentially explosive information about us that could maybe ruin our lives. 
and they have a fiduciary duty to use that information only for our interests, except in very extreme circumstances when there is a crime or something. But our doctor, for instance, cannot take my personal information and sell it to third parties for profits. And the same principle should hold uh, w w w with our relationship with the high-tech giants. I mean, right. they should have the same responsibilities. How, how do you think about this trade-off between efficiency and inefficiency in that uh, inefficiency, inefficiency sounds like it's a bug, but as you point out in the book, there are places where it's a feature because it is, yeah. it's a bulwark against totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. And yet we want a certain kind of efficiency so as to be able to find malicious actors and terrorists, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you view that in a, in a, in a reasonably well-functioning democracy that has institutions that are error correcting both with respect to truth and with respect to order? How would you, if you could get your hands on the, on the dial of efficiency, mm. how would you tune it? I mean, that's the democratic conversation. We avoid the extremes and find the middle path, and you're bound to make mistakes. So uh, uh, keep correcting your mistakes. Uh, it's not like there is a magic bullet that solves it once, once and for all. Right. Um, so, you know, what is the right level of surveillance? What is the right level of immigration? You know, this is what we have the democratic debate for. If you go for an extreme position that, uh, you know, humans have a, a, a right to immigrate to anywhere they like in as, as, as huge as numbers as they like, this is completely, completely unfeasible. Open um, borders, yeah. So again, how many immigrants a country want to absorb uh, and under what conditions, let's discuss. Different people have different views. I don't think that people who want a more uh, uh, strict immigration uh, uh, policy, this immediately turns them into fascists and Nazis. And similarly, people who want more lenient immigration policies, less restrictive, that doesn't turn them immediately into traitors who want to destroy the country. Um, let's have a conversation and try this policy and try that policy. It should not be a kind of all-out war between good and evil. And the same goes for the level of surveillance and the same goes for the level, again, of free speech. I mean, in all these cases, we need to find a middle path and it's difficult, and we need to start with the assumption that we are not infallible and that other people might have good ideas about these questions. Okay, so let's take this general framework that you've sketched in your book and look at a few uh, current events. So we have, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there really is too much to talk about, but we have <laughs> the, the U.S. election, we have the ongoing war in Ukraine, we have the ongoing war between Israel and now on uh, at least two fronts, mm -hmm. uh, Israel and her enemies. Um, let's start with the U.S. election. How do you yeah. view uh, our circumstances? So let's just, I just need to take a moment there saying Israel and her enemies. So when people look at Palestinians as the enemy of Israel, and I, I honestly don't know if he's talking about that or Lebanon and Syria, um, but that is how Israel looks at Palestinians. They are other, they are below. Uh, Israel has been apartheid state for 40, 50, 50, fuck, how old am I? Probably about closer to 65 or 70 years. And now it, People, for whatever reason, are afraid to call what Israel is doing rightfully a genocide. Um, I've been, I think it was, I was a, October, November, I think it was like December when it first became like clear this was not a normal sort of. Um, well, I don't know if there's a normal reaction to a terrorist event. I mean, fuck, look what America did after 9-11 for 20 years. Look at it, like several generations of kids that we fucked up by sending them over there. Um, but I digress. Uh, it's this sort of blanket bigotry that I have seen from Sam Harris 
Which again, to me, is kind of ironic because he constantly talks about Buddhism and mindful meditation and not clinging to that which is not there, right? So we talk about, well, I don't want to get into it, but I guess it's ironic to me, and I guess it kind of speaks to Harari's point is that we're all fallible. And just because someone is fallible doesn't make them evil, but just because someone is a bigot doesn't mean that I have to support them. So, anyway, on with the show. Circumstance here. I mean, we, there has been, I mean, we really are the, the poster child for a lot of the mm. dysfunction you describe uh, more generically in your book. I mean, there's, there's just a uh, a pervasive sense that uh, I think uh, I think social media is, is doesn't fully explain it, but it is, certainly has amplified the problem. There's a pervasive sense that we have we've lost the capacity to uh, speak to one another about yeah. rather fundamental issues, mm -hmm. and we're just hurtling towards some political catastrophe here. Yeah. I so, mean, uh, so we have an, we have an election, which, however it goes, it's quite plausible to imagine that half the country won't believe the results, right? Mm -hmm. Given given what has happened in recent years. So how do we pull back from the brink mm -hmm. here? So historically, there are two big dangers for the survival of democracies. And you can see both of them now in the US. One big danger is uh, what we discussed earlier. Democracy is this system when... All right, so I do not subscribe to Sam Harris's podcast. I don't pay for it. This seems to be uh, 43 minutes of a two hour and seven minute podcast, which is unfortunate. I wish I could listen to the whole thing. So if you are like me, a fan of uh, Mr. Harari, and you know where there are longer discussions or podcasts of him that dive into his work, uh, please let me know. I would absolutely love to listen to those and not, hopefully not have to worry about, um, yeah, extreme bigotry uh, in there as well. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And uh, as always, good luck, America.